All right, good afternoon. This is the uh, February 1st, 2019 meeting of the Human Resources Committee here in the first floor conference room at City Hall. Um, I'm Alderman Stephen Colt, and we'll just go around the room and introduce ourselves real quick. Don Urban, HR. Shane Blazer. Brian Landowski, IT. Joe Terry, Director of Public Works. Jennifer Gossick, City Clerk. Joe Zerflu. Scott Kellogg, Alderman. Uh, Sue Show. All right. Um, our first item here is to discuss and consider approval for the requesting, the revised requesting personnel policy. This is a follow up to the January 15th, 2019 council meeting, wherein the, the council requested that the following language be added to the policy. If the requisition and replacement process is not timely proceeding, the filling of the position will be addressed in the next HR committee agenda. I guess I'll start with you on that, Dawn. Sure. Okay, so the second uh, item in your HR packet is the policy, and it's entitled Requesting Personnel. And I simply copied the language, the, the language that we had agreed on at the last council meeting and added it. It's the highlighted portion on page one. So um, I think that's kind of self-explanatory, just merely adding that language to the policy. Any discussion on this? Shane? Um, I guess I haven't had a chance to read it, but yeah, that's that's exactly what we discussed on. Yeah. Joe. Joe. Good. Scott. Um yeah, it looks fine, but timely proceeding. So let's say so what it is is if you're giving yourself two months to fill. I mean, maybe the job and the skill set for the job and the amount of people out there, you may require you to take two months. So you wouldn't necessarily have to come to us the, the let's say the second month, but you would probably have to come the third month. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's just a, a judgment call and I think that's fair to have because some might be very challenging because of the amount of people sure. on the workforce and sure. the skill set. So, um, but I think what's what's good is that it was mentioned that we would have a list of openings, and then we would know which openings are there and how soon they're filled. So I think that that takes care of the timeliness. I think. So I think for me, it's even a step further back where. That it should come to HR with that amount of like, yeah, excuse me, I had surgery yesterday, so I'm very nasal. Um, we had, uh, so if if an open position is there, let's, so we have one at River Cities Access, and it, so if that, if it's decided that we're going to recreate that position or just fill it, in that first month, if it's decided that it's just filled, then HR goes ahead and fills it. If it's decided that it's going to be recreated, or a new position is going to be coming out of that, then at that first HR meeting, I think that's when HR should be advised that, hey, we have this open position, we're no longer going to have that position, we want to create it into a different position, which we're working on, and just a better update. Yeah, I'd just like to have this discussion so we have a common understanding. <coughs> it's vague, but yet I think we all understand where we're coming from. Oh, uh make a motion to accept the wording that's been placed in the uh, requesting personnel policy. I'll second it. All right. So motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Let's all have our boots. Uh, next is update regarding contracting with third party consultant to provide culture assessment. This is a follow-up from Alderperson and Grass Referral for an employee survey. Um, no action requested. I guess we'll start. Sure. So I guess I just wanted to provide an update on this agenda item. I believe it was referred at the December council meeting. Correct me if, if anyone feels that that's not correct. It was. Okay. So um, we have taken steps. I have been in contact with Ideation Consulting. Um, I do anticipate receiving a proposal next week 
and I would anticipate bringing that proposal forward to the committee, um, to the March committee me meeting for HR to review, and um, at that time I'm anticipating to ask for consideration and approval for that. Um, it would include an employee survey. It may include more than an employee survey. It may include um, personal interviews. It may include focus groups. And it would be a comprehensive assessment where not only would they do a survey and focus group, they would also come back, um, interpret results for us, go over results, and help us determine priorities. So help us determine what was ac actually um, conveyed or survey results showed, and then help us prioritize um, what it is that we should be working on and how it is that we should go about that. Go ahead, Chair. So will, will this be like different proposals or, obviously we're not reinventing the wheel here. These, this must go on all over the place. Yeah. Is it a la carte thing? Well, we'd like to have this survey, uh, maybe this survey, or does this something designed specific for the organization? Um, I haven't seen the okay. actual proposal yet. But I would, I would think that it is somewhat a la carte. You can pick from services, okay. and I would think that it would be catered to, to the city. Okay. Where are they, where are they located? Uh, ideation is located out of the cities. Yeah. This is the area. <laughs> Anyone else on this? All right. Um, no action is requested, so I guess on that we will just move on to our next item here, which is discussion regarding the city's current recruitment or uh, sorry, current retirement policy as it relates to creating an incentive for employees to provide advance notice on the retirement date. Um, so a referral from me. So. I'll start with you on that okay, on. Sure. So um, currently we have a situation and we've had a recent situation where HR had less than two weeks notice that an individual was going to retire. Um, that obviously does not give HR much time to post the position or have discussions about if we are posting that position exactly like it like it is today um, to get it going posted and everything else and it would not allow enough time for us to get someone in um, obviously before that person retires so I think the goal the real goal here is to find a way to have employees give us advance notice. Um, I've seen in past employers a 60-day notice, and I think that that is um, appropriate. I think that that allows enough time. Um, you know, currently, part of it may be that we need to look at some incentives, such as allowing individuals, when they give notice, to use personal time and to use those floating holidays. The way the policy currently reads is that if you give your notice, you are not able to use your floating holidays and your personal days. So perhaps we need to look at revising that to incent individuals to give us um, notice for that retirement. Go ahead. And w was there a change in the past few years where you can't retire off vacation? Like so, yeah. you could use your vacation but then you had to come back for a day or two or something? Or was that not a change actually? She hasn't been a policy change, but Dawn, I don't know that, if That has not been a policy change. What we had tried to, to actually do is say, managers, if you have individuals off for five weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, are you going to have that person come back? Are they going to have some kind of a, a going away, or what are we doing for that individual? <coughs> so certain areas have had those individuals come back for one day or one week. Other areas have not had those individuals return back. And the department heads are always approving their big time off requests, right? So if they plan to retire and the department had grants and approval for their time off request, I mean, I think that's where I guess the question may, may come in. So has the issue become, let's say I had three months of vacation and comp time, whatever built up personal mm -hmm. time, and I just say, well, I'm retiring on this date, but on my back date, three months of personal time or vacation. Has that caused that issue or? Um, I think it's more or less that HR just doesn't have that notice and that HR just has not been given that date. Um, okay. 
I, I guess, wow, if apartments can afford to have a person off for three months, um, and, and I don't know, maybe there are departments or maybe there are slow times. But, but I, I think, but I just, yeah. I, I continue on, go ahead. I was just gonna, as an example, um, you know, at the street department, we allow a certain number of people to be off on any given day. And so if the calendar is available, and someone wants to take a three three week vacation and they have that time available that's granted um, the, the problem we have is that if the person is going to retire and they and they don't offer notice well it doesn't give us time to plan you know because especially in an area like the street department we may juggle a lot of positions depending on who's retiring before we're ready to hire the next person and so the actual replacement of a staff member might take a while because we'll give it some time for a, you know if it's a um, equipment operator or whatever th there's a lot of positions that you might buy space. for that yeah. we, we look at those internally if we fill it internally now maybe we have another void internally mm -hmm. so it, it takes some time before we get to the point where we're ready to hire someone from outside to fill a vacancy and without time to plan you know, and unless the person gives notice that they intend to retire, well, it's inappropriate for us to start, you know, shuffling the deck, so to speak. And and it and it can put us, um, you know, in an operating situation that is months out after the person's actually retired. And if they've got two or three weeks of vacation that they're taking, it might be a month and a half, you know, before we're able to replace somebody. So it, it can be it can be a struggle, and we really would like to try to. Um, encourage the staff in whatever way we can to make that announcement as soon as they know. And as a, a municipal employee, you, you know. I mean, you, you're setting up your retirement program mm -hmm. and you know plenty in advance. It's just a matter of working with uh, working with the HR department on it. Cool. Well, I wonder part of the issue though is if I had six weeks of vacation and I know I want to get denied, if I'm, if, in my mind, if I'm going to retire on this date, I backdate it six weeks, and I get denied part of it. I don't know, like your incentive, you know. If I would put in and tell you I'm going to retire June 1st, and I'm going to use a month's vacation, if it's allowable in the books, well, I would tell you I'm not coming back, you know, so you could plan ahead. And I think that's what you want employees to feel comfortable doing, coming in. And I don't know if you need to incentivize it, but I just think that they need to be able to know that they could burn off the time off the book. Obviously, everyone's staying on the books as long as possible because of insurance. So so you're, you're saving all your time to the end, trying to carry out insurance and also pushing your retirement to get a couple extra dollars in retirement. So yeah, I'd say the incentive is try to get people, even if they're taking four weeks off, if it's allowed in the schedule, that at that time, they, whether it's a documentation that says something that i I'm on vacation, I'm retiring, so you know ahead of time, and I'm not going to say, oh, I'm coming back, surprise, but I think some better communication would be better, but I don't know if there... If but there's disincentives now. For, well, you know, once once you've, and correct me if I'm wrong, once you've announced your retirement, you know, you lose any remaining personal days. Yeah. You lose your floating holidays. You, you don't, if you, don't you, you no longer accrue any benefits as an employee, if I'm no, correct. You should yeah. up until your last day, right? No. You accrue benefits. Like you, you do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're working. You do, but the the way the policy reads is once you give your notice, you're not able to use those floating holidays and personal days. Can they be pulled? Can they be? Denied once they've been posted. Because that's what we're running into and what we oh, see. Okay. Is the misconception out there is personal days and holidays could be pulled once you give notice. So I think we're okay. seeing later and later notice okay. <coughs> due to this can, perception out there that they can be pulled by the city, especially personal days. So there's no incentive to say you're going to You'll retire. to your two weeks, I think. Right. We, we see what's going on, but. Oh, um, I, I wasn't aware of that, I guess. Okay. I haven't personally pulled any days. Um, I just wasn't aware of that. Or is it concerned that it might be pulled, but it just hasn't been done? Or I, I'm never aware of it being done, so I, I think yeah, it's it would just be a, good to be out there and what everybody... Yeah, if I'm you not want to retire July 1st, and if you want to run your vacation 
for us, I think every department's different, but we have vacation picking policies, and as long as you're operating within our policy and you're moving your time back, I don't think there should be any incentive not to give notice as soon as you can. And as long as you're picking within our policy, you can post what you have coming to you. Mm -hmm. So then we get notice sooner rather than right. what we're seeing. And it would help all the way, not only with recruiting, but you know, even in Joe's situation, if that's happening in the summer, you're short and mm -hmm. you're incurring overtime. So let's try to be proactive on the recruiting side and also to have employees in here so we're not incurring that overtime. Right. I just have a question because I thought there was some concern about liability with workman's comp and things that when people are on a terminal leave situation, they're active employees. Well, right? oh. so I so think I that we need to, to bring that to the front. So if you are on a six week leave, let's say you're going to retire July 1st, you take leave from May 15th on, you're an active employee. So if you're on the city property, let's say you came back and you volunteered to do something, you're on our premises, yeah, that could be workers' comp. Or you're an active employee, um, you're sick or a family member is sick, yes, you have to grant that as family leave because you're an active employee. So, I mean, I think that we should be aware of that. That's a good thing to bring to the surface. Yeah, and I think it's hard to quantify that proactively, right, or, or ahead of a circumstance arising. I, I just, I, I don't have any strong feelings about it. I just know we've talked about that. And I think the other point that was raised about documentation, most employers require some sort of acknowledgement or sign off when a retirement's gonna happen. Right, I Correct. think we probably should institute something. Correct. I mean, because you can, as I understand, you, once you file your date with WRS, you can actually change that once, right? Or something like that. I mean, yeah. I haven't looked into yeah. it, but I, you know, yeah. as, I I've believe heard you have folks to change can do that once they get their date. And there's a certain time period, period, you have to have at least 30 days to do that, I believe. And they won't accept, I'm going through this, so they won't accept paperwork 60 days before your retirement date either. They don't want it, so 60 days to the state is what you said in your paperwork. Okay. So is it reasonable to ask employees, I guess is my question, to provide a 60-day notice? Well, it's a penalty if they don't, can't retire. <laughs> I don't well, that's really issue. I, I don't, if there is no penalty, you can't really. I don't, I don't think you can really penalize an employee for not providing a notice. Like, my experience in the private sector, when you choose to leave a job, you give a two-week notice, right? But Wisconsin, we're an employment at will state, so either the employee or the employee can terminate employment with or, with, no, with or without notice at any given time. So, I mean, you know, basically if I want to quit my job today, I can go in and tell my boss I quit. There's not anything that they can really do to me for not giving them a two week notice other than probably just never hire me back to that job again. So we can't, we can't penalize for somebody not to give a notice, but we can certainly encourage them to give notice so, so it gives the employer time to fill that position. Because we're, the issue we're running into is um, we've had these, to the way I understand it, we have these vacancies that come up. Somebody goes out on vacation, they're gone for four weeks plus, and they just, they never come back. And then we have departments that are working short. We have people that are incurring overtime. And I think when Joe brought this idea up last month, that's, that's what he's trying to eliminate here. But on the other end of it, a thought that comes to mind is, Let's say somebody decides to retire, and then they, they change their mind and they don't want to retire. Well, what do we do in that situation? I know now if we're already going out and we're accepting applications for the position, are we creating a false illusion that somebody thinks that they might be getting a job at the street department, or are we simply going to market it as um, we believe there might be a uh, projected vacancy in our street department, so what we want to do is we want to create an eligibility list so when somebody retires, we have a pool of candidates to pick from. I, I think I agree with the mayor with, you know, maybe it's worth finding out at what point can you change your retirement date? So if, if it's within 60 days and you choose September 1st as your date, you can no longer change that. Well, then obviously you can't come back as an employee. So if we do that in that window that, that you can't change that date, well, then you're pretty sure that position is going to be open. And also, maybe we just take it back to department heads, go ask their employees, what's creating them to 
uh, you know, you have disgruntled employees that are just going to do it to mess with the system, but but why are the reasons why are they only giving short notice? Well, and, and that's, I mean, I, I've asked staff that, okay. and that's, that's the reason why is that there's disincentive right now to give notice. Of course. Because of loss of loss of those particular benefits that a regular employee otherwise has. So, oh. you know, I think I've seen I've seen I've seen it done a couple of ways. One might be to incentivize by doing something that we aren't doing now, like offering offering that time. Another might be to incentivize some of the post retirement benefits that employees get by policy that you need to give notice in order to be able to get those post employment benefits. You know, I mean, there's there's a number of ways to do it. Um, you know, my previous employer, if you, you had to get, if you were going to be able to collect, um, and, and it was set up a little bit differently, but if you wanted to collect unused vacation, unused personal time that would otherwise be available, you had to give 30 days notice. If you gave 30 days notice, then you got a lump sum payout for whatever you didn't use, you know. It's exactly use it all, it's no big deal, but, you know, so there's a number of ways to address it, but. I think it is an issue right now. It, it makes it challenging for us to plan. Basically, I was going to no. say similar to you. Uh, I think a lump sum payout, if it's half the salary that they would have had that accumulated holidays and sick days, etc. I don't know what the formula would be, but that way they can still work and they would get that payout. I mean, um, it seems why rather I mean the problem is overtime, and the problem is um, pay, um, posting the position and getting it filled. Well, if you can take care of both of those by a person announcing it 60 days ahead of time and get a payout of whatever formula is created, I think and you keep that employee. It seems to me the person that accumulates quite a few sick days and holidays, etc., is a is a uh, an employee that is dedicated yeah. and on the job and so forth, have him work all the way down to his retirement or her retirement, and then they have a lump sum to be able to go on vacation or have it for insurance or whatever. It seems reasonable. Our, and just for Might clarification, are, are you saying that either they could use their holidays and their personal days or be paid out for those? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, if they choose to use their holidays, yeah. most likely they'll sign up to use their holidays. So I, I would say either or, you, you know. You would say either, okay. Um, and have them work all the way to the retirement and have a lump sum to take a vacation or, like I say, for health benefits. So. And I, like I say, I don't know what the benefit, I don't know what the formula, but I would say half the, half the salary or that you would have. You got children shared. Yeah. So the so the challenge now is that there's, there's no incentive if a person has three weeks of vacation and they're wrapping it up. There's if they want to take that vacation. And basically take payment for not working, right? They'll they'll do it three weeks before their last day because yeah. they're still getting. Health insurance benefits and, and other things that cost real money until that time, and and generally overtime isn't at, at least in the public works department. I'm not sure in the fire department is the overtime part is an issue because is not an issue because again we don't allow more people to take vacation than what fits in the schedule. So if that person isn't coming back, it's not a problem until after they don't come back because they're not asking for vacation after they've retired, but someone else might be. So when they're still employed but taking a, taking vacation, there's there's no overtime issues generally with that. It'd be nice. Because we're operating status right. quo. Whether they're retiring or not, that's how we operate on a daily basis. But if they left that, if they gave you a notice before they went on that three-week vacation, at least it would be more helpful? or Absolutely, because it's after they leave. Is where it and, and just the process of... To get more time. Yes, of, of planning getting people in positions as we're kind of shuffling the deck, new hires, yeah. you know, and in, especially in this particular market. I mean, we, we've had a, a skilled position that we were attempting to recruit for. How long did it take us to recruit that position? We had two people that, after we gave the offer, declined. Oh, gosh. Um, Three months? Easily, because we offered it twice. Right. Um, they initially accepted, and then they called back and declined. 
So you know, so we've so, got a position that's a, a, a skilled position at the at the garage that, you know, we had a plan for how we wanted to do this, and it and it really did work around someone's retirement who's going to retire soon and, and moving shuffling the deck so that we'd be able to mentor this new person. And in this particular economy, we still struggled, and it's taken three months to get that person on board. And I think we've got a, you know, we've got an accepted offer. They're going to be starting soon, but we've had a, a void there. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I don't think we're gonna maybe get anything out of this today without having a clear-cut policy or anything to look at so I guess what my thoughts are and we'll see how the committee feels about this here but look at um, bringing this back next month with some uh, documentation or something that we can show if an employee announces their retirement within 30 to 60 days of anticipated retirement date, um, the incentives that the city would offer for them to announce their retirement, if it's um, working with their vacation, their personal holidays or floating holidays, um, something that what Joe Terry's alluded to of really getting them to come forward and say, hey, I'm gonna re retire so human resources at that point in time can say, okay, I have an upcoming vacancy, so I'm gonna create an eligibility list so we can get some candidates to, to recruit from, I I think would really be a, a good way to go. And yeah. Their accrued vacation, they get paid out no matter what. Yeah, right? Right. Right. So, so right. the only thing you really are on the table is floating holidays, is it? And personal days. And personal days. <clears throat> so yeah, I guess, how many, it's probably different, how many personal and floating holidays you get a year or is it consistent? It's I mean, five or seven, depending on yeah, the work. Yeah, just if there's an, right. enough of an incentive with just those days, because they're going to get their vacation anyways. So try to figure out what that incentive would be, going beyond maybe that, if you have to. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think the policy should really emphasize that you, you get this if you announce your retirement within the 30 to 60 day window. If you don't announce your retirement, then you you don't get the the benefit from it. Does would you guys be in agreement to have that? Yeah, I, I just yeah, seeing numbers would be good because yeah. we're talking generalizations. For your so first forth. month of insurance, I don't know. I just don't know what. Well, what's the benefit though? That's what I'm not understanding because if they do it the way that they're doing it right now, they're getting everything. And that, I think that's the whole thing, is that there is a disincentive. So what is the actual incentive? There isn't anything. We haven't even provided anything as like an incentive if, if an employee. I mean, what, what I got from Mr. Young is that there's a distrust in management that stuff could be pulled, or at least I insinuated that from what the fire chief's remarks were. So how do we shore that trust back up first to ensure that the employees feel comfortable announcing their retirement without, without something being pulled away from them that they think is theirs or that they are entitled to? So we need to identify that first, and then we need to identify a policy if they extrapolate it out, how far would it be in advance so that if there is a retirement date, they retire at this date and they get health insurance paid until that extrapolated date, something like that. Now that would be an incentive, but we haven't even identified an incentive first for someone to retire within a three to or a 30 day to 60 days. So that's what, what needs to be identified, I think here. Because otherwise, it, they, they, otherwise the status quo is going to continue. Well, but the current policy is that there's an incentive. There's a you do, if you don't give a certain amount of, or you can't take these days until you, if you give your, you can't use those days after you say you're going to retire. I mean that's the policy now. So I think I think the change is to to allow them to to take that those. Days. Yes, and you just said it. It hasn't been said. So the, what what are we looking at is actually incentivizing by allowing everything that you would accrual if you didn't use it or get paid. Use it or get paid type of a thing. 
you are entitled to it, it isn't going to get taken away, and we got to make a policy that explicitly says that. And that, that's absolutely what we want to do, or that's, that's where we want to go with it. Uh, and, and especially if it's a case where um, someone has six weeks of vacation, that's a month and a half, if they're still on the books as an employee, again, talking about workers' comp or different things like that, as an organizational standpoint, we want that employee to be done as soon as possible. So that's where a payout comes out, that's where a guarantee of personal leave, of sick leave, or whatever, whatever the entitlement is. And once that person is, because as an organizational standpoint, we want to move on. You know, it, 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 in a personal aspect, well, he or she might get an extra day and, well, who cares? Let's cut it, the employment, move forward as an organization and do what we need to do. And if it, it sounds like it's costing us more money now because we can't recruit or people turn stuff down. So <laughs> one or two or 10 days of, of pay uh, has got to be a drop in the bucket for, for you know, our situation. So let's let's fix it. Let's incentivize it. What what uh, the city attorney just said, and and put that in writing and move forward. I mean, it, this is cut and dry. I don't know. So, but, but I guess it's still. But um, because a couple months ago we were here talking, or maybe it was at a staff meeting about how we didn't like that these people were running all this out for two or three months, and they were taking all the irregardless of the personal time or the whatever. They made sure that they took those ahead of time, but. And, and so they would be on vacation or uh, personal time, holidays for like the last three months. Their retirement party would be three months before they, <laughs> they left. We were sending out the invites, I mean, everything. And then, and they were never expected to come back, but, but they're still out there. There's this liability, and that this isn't going to change that. This will probably encourage that. There'll be more days to take. But, I, you know, and I guess that's kind of a separate issue is, is why were we talking about that and is that not really an issue? Is that not an issue when people are, you know, the last three months of their employment, they're not, they're not. As two officers, yeah. uh, we've had their cake <laughs> and ice cream <laughs> and they haven't returned to work for eight weeks. Right. But yet, they burn that time, they put in their 30, mm -hmm. 25, 30 years and they've and they didn't plan take under vacation. our rules and they've taken vacation yeah. and they ran a bad day, plan for 25, 30 years. But why is it they're not giving notice? At the end of October, well, why are they waiting? Till up, these I hear them coming up to yeah. HR. Every, it's like they're not giving their official notice. Everybody right. knows they're leaving, but they're saving that official notice because of the personal days, or right. or you know, or whatever. Or the, yeah, there's just no and reason what, to. Or they're not happy and they just want to do it that way. But I agree that there's a. Uh, I mean, there's kind of three different things going on, and what's the what's really the issue? And 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 I'm sure there's some way to, to kind of. Yeah, I think that's pretty you know. common practice, especially a protective side. But um, yeah, if cause like you said, 60 days. They know 60 days at least in advance of the. They know well before that because they're requesting their package well before that. But they're, that's 60 days, so they know 60 days beforehand. And you know, obviously, they're running it out because it's insurance. You get two, three months of insurance. They're saving that time, so they're getting that insurance time. But yeah, it's the plan to get them to let the, if they're taking that last three months sign something so at least you can start hiring and getting somebody there. Or even identify who's going to fill that position. Right, or go through that internal until process. Until that notice comes in, I couldn't even put in a requisite right. request right. to fill this mm -hmm. position and get that person identified mm -hmm. and trained. And, yeah. and so, go through your internal post Every process. department, I think, is you know different. So that's mm -hmm. what we deal with in the fire department. Dawn, I know you've got a lot going on right now, but do you think we could give a policy to look at by next month? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I um, very much am in favor of uh, what Alderperson Kubitschek had suggested. Make I it think, clean and easy. I think that makes sense to us. I mean, instead of having one of those, well, you know, they might be getting an extra, who cares? As an organizational standpoint, we got to move on. Write a check. All right. So we'll come back to that next month. Item, uh, next item, just, oh, oh, um, I guess I'll make a motion to uh, have a policy change brought back to this committee next month. I'll second. All right, motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? 
ayes have it. Um, next item is uh, discussion regarding the current IT director position. Uh, this is a, another referral for me. I'll start with you, Dawn. Okay, so um, I think as everyone is aware, we have had the director of IT um, posted and advertised. We thought we actually had a, a candidate this past November. Um, that individual ended up not uh, accepting that offer. So at the present time, we do have the position currently open. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. We do not have um, active applicants at this time, and I do think Part of that is due to the fact that we needed to repost in December. Um, December is not a good time to actually be on the market and, and looking for candidates, particularly for um, positions that require higher skills. So. Um, I know we had a couple options to look at with our IT director position. We can try to leave it as is and leave it out there and see if we can fill it. Um, we could, there's, I was given some information on some cities that had some comparables and given the scope and the authority of the IT director job, we could try to um, increase the base salary for that job and see if anyone would be interested in it. Um, or I, I'm under the understanding that there was uh, a desire to reduce the scope of the authority of the job and try to fill it. Um, that way and just making an IT lead position. Um, so I think now is probably a good time to have that discussion and, and see which way we want to go with it and I'll open up if anyone wants to weigh in on this. I guess I will. I, I'm in favor of uh, eliminated uh, not trying to fill that position as is. I don't see any value in increasing the salary. In my mind, I have a hard time wrapping around that we're going to pay this person more than we pay our wastewater treatment op plant op guy in charge out there. And realistically, our, our size of our community and our organization, we need somebody in charge of that department directing the work. And and uh, so another so you have another basically employee that's in charge of the department. You know, any other any other needs that it could be handled outside of that. We've, we've operated in this organization forever without this position. Um, for years we operated with one person. Um, I just think that a, a lead person would be the best fit and having having another staff person in there and, and then like the interns that they do, and I think that's more than plenty of people operate the IT needs of the city. Kind of agree, a uh, lead person. And if there's a project that's very sophisticated or whatever, farm it out. Yep. I mean, have the money there. I mean, you said the salary and so forth increased, but the lead person wouldn't be as much. And so that difference, that gap, could be used for its unique, specific projects yep. that we could farm out to some or local group and then. Uh, to me, that might make sense. <laughs> I would like to hear from a guy that works in the okay. computer realm. Okay. Coincidentally, I, I didn't set this up, but if, since you're here, let's hear what, what your opinion is. Well, I wanted to find out how the alderman felt about this position. That's why I'm here. Well, but do we need another personnel involved in this, or is this something that we could farm out to, like an EO Johnson or Infotech or Byron Fines or whoever else does that kind of when stuff? We, um, when Brian Brown was here, we were starting to look at getting a, another requisition for another position. Um, that we felt we needed some more help uh, with skills. Um, and I know uh, when the previous um, IT um, technician was here, he did um, kind of fall back on some of the, I guess, major projects or infrastructure. So, because he was constantly doing help desk. Um, so he was always looking for that extra help, um, either from water and light or, or other areas. And yeah, I'm I'm kind of like in the same way where maybe the salary is a little bit too high because I feel like why spend all that money on one person when that one person where is that budget money going to come if he's going to come up with all these ideas and projects and change you know you're you're spending so much money on a salary but you're not having the funds or the budget to implement any of those projects or or ideas um, for innovation. 
well, can we get a firm for approximately the cost of what the salary and benefits are that would meet the needs of what we have or what the at least a bare minimum of what we need for the IT department? I've looked at a couple um, uh, vendors to provide maybe a help desk service. Um, they come with what we have right now about um, if you had a full service help desk, about $90,000 um, per year. Um, if you wanted to cut back on what they actually provide, it could be a little bit less, um, closer to twenty, twenty to $40,000. Would that full service help desk service our needs? It would take care of a lot of the help desk issues, but, but it still wouldn't help out with a lot of the infrastructure. Yeah, as I was going to say, it would be nice to have a person on staff if you need help pulling wire or, you know, the help desk person is just going to do help versus if you're running new wire or doing other beyond help desk needs, it would be nice to be able to pull a second person that's our employee that could, could do those things. Yeah, it's good to have somebody on site so that we know what's going on if the help desk isn't available or, or they're tied up with other issues, but that somebody here that knows what's going on so that the staff can meet with them and discuss their needs and that uh, it can be directed locally and we have the documentation and the processes in place you know that we're comfortable with because you get a, another vendor in that does help desk stuff they're going to do it their way and they're going to want to change things that aren't as comfortable to end users as uh, somebody local can see the needs that are here the end user skills and the technology that are, is being used. Um, I think it's, it's ideal to have somebody here, maybe something to assist with that, but I mean, with somebody being able to lead um, another help desk technician or some other um, network analyst or something, you have that knowledge of the overall picture of how the infrastructure is supposed to be, how it's supposed to work, and you can get that done. <coughs> Rather than keep on paying vendors to keep doing things, and then the people who are local don't know what they did or how to, how to fix it, so they have to keep going back to those vendors to correct some of those issues. Well, and a little bit different uh, question here. Um, I'm not much of a computer guy. I think I still got like Windows 98 or something on my PC. <laughs> but uh, why, in your opinion, and maybe this, maybe you can't answer this, why hasn't, why haven't we received a lot of interest with this particular job posting? That, I don't know directly know. I know um, I've probably talked to about a half dozen people um, previously before Brian Brown was um, hired because I thought a lot of them were skilled and qualified. And a lot of them were like, uh, that position was a little bit too vague and too broad. So they didn't, they didn't want to look at that. Plus, they were making quite a bit more than that position was. Um, um, providing so that was some of the reason that it just didn't like the broad um, scope the, the position and then um, the pay just wasn't going to meet what their needs were go ahead thank you I, I, okay. I don't have the floor anymore I, I'll get to you here I just want to weigh in for a second I remember first off I'm going to back up here a moment, and I know I've heard some people echo sentiments about this that this is a another management position that we don't necessarily need. But when I was new to the council about four years ago, I'm going to pick on you here for a moment, Joe. The council was looking at getting the uh, public works director, and I know that there was some concern about it that it's just going to be another guy in in management that we don't necessarily need. No, I've worked with Joe for about four years and and Joe in his capacity um, works with wastewater, works with the street department, works with engineering, works with the airport. Did I forget anything in there? I think you got it. <laughs> and, and I mean I think for what we got when we got Joe Terry we got um, we got a pretty good deal. We got a guy that's holding these departments together and he's able to manage them and he's He's um, effectively gotten part departments to work together where they need to work together, and uh, public works committees changed when Joe got on the scene. I mean, the, the communication from the ground up 
to the committee level has been phenomenal under Joe's leadership. And the way that I'm looking at this uh, IT director is, it, yeah, it's a management position, um, but I think it's going to be a position that will bridge the gap between community access and the actual IT department. And a lot of our TV stuff is going more computerized today. And I, I understand there's concern that an IT director is going to make more money than the wastewater treatment individual, but communications is a it's a it's it's a thing that people go to school for a really long time to understand. I mean, you, you program writing programs, computers have their own languages. I if I lost a program on my computer, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I'd probably be on the phone with Microsoft talking to some guy named Kevin with a Hindi accent and trying to figure figure out how to fix my computer. I I think we do need the position. It's just the scope and the authority of the position. Um, but I, I know there was like concerns about getting Joe Terry as a public works director and what's the guy gonna do? I, I think we gotta give it a chance because after we got Joe, Joe proved to be an asset to the city. It, it worked, I think, I think that maybe over time we might need to fine tune this position and see how it goes, but I, I think we gotta give it a chance. Um, I'll get to you, Shane, but uh, Joe did want to speak, so. Oh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to comment real quick as an, as an end user, so I have a, a different perspective because, you know, I'm, I'm getting help from these guys, and, um, you know, the, the, the general level of assistance and professionalism is excellent, but I, I see an issue in two places. One is there's just not enough help that, that the, uh, the pace is, is too high, you know, for the staff that's there right now. And, you know, so, so that's, that's one factor. The, the other factor is that I do believe that there is a, a real need for um, some leadership that a director brings. Whether or not it's a director in the form that currently is being advertised, or whether that's modified so that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish, I don't know that I have the answer for that. But I do think we need some direction, and I do think that we need um, you know, a, a staff member that has authority to um, take that direction and, and make that direction for the department. Um, You know, again, as an end user, I don't have any particular issue with changing up the job description a bit and, uh, and really trying to work with staff that we have. Uh, you know, what can we recruit in a reasonable amount of time so that we can move forward with our department? Because we do have some things, and I've, I've talked to Brian about them, I've talked to the previous IT director about them. You know, there's some things that we need as, as uh, users, IT users in this organization, some guidance, some policies, some consistencies, and those activities come from someone who actually has time to develop them. And, you know, again, from, from my experience, Brian's time is maintaining that infrastructure and being very responsive on help desk calls. There's, there's not the time needed to be able to address some of the more policy related issues so that we can become more streamlined and and their job gets easier also so um, I, I, I guess it long story short I think we need someone in a director type position a lead position um, but as an end user I, I, I wish the mayor would have stuck around a little bit because you know, he, he provides some of that guidance too for all of the departments but I think we do need someone that has enough time. We need enough staff so that we have someone that has enough time to be able to do those communication tasks, be able to guide us as users and guide the department, you know, to success. Sure. I can't disagree more, but <laughs> you go from some of us were out in the late 90s, seeing what we had then, and you know, it's gone up and down. And I do, I do agree that we need a, a lead person, somebody, but I think we 
we need like a Brian who don't, has all the base knowledge, but somebody who's going to be responsible for directing workloads, having some time to go through, maybe develop some policies. But I, I don't think we need this ninety thousand dollar a year position in, a, in the city of Wisconsin Rapids to to innovate ideas on our organization. We're not that huge. Matter of fact, we have a whole lot less employees now than we did back in the nineties. And so I think we're overcomplicating. We need a couple of people that can pull wire, run run networks, but then, but then also that next step, maybe another step above that's going to be responsible for directing the workload, directing the IT, uh, the interns, developing some policies, and that's it. You know, and anything else that Scott said can be farmed out. We can we can hire a consultant. If, did we hire a consultant when we hired or got to do software, the financial HR? That was what, <coughs> quarter of a million dollar software package? And was that something handled outside or internally? And we didn't have a director of it. Did we have Brian then? So Did Brian, was Brian part of that? Um, actually, both. Okay. Is true. So they do have a package that is called uh, Tether Support that I am highly recommending we have at least for the first year to help Brian get through. Um, especially when we are I'm sorry, not the, for the other the director of innovation technology, not Brian. Oh, not this Brian. Oh, so, so yeah, did I'm trying help to help with the selection yeah, process. Yeah. And I, I have to say that ultimately HR made the decision only because um, there was only really one product that would meet the needs of HR. No. There were probably three products that would really meet the needs of, of finance. The other two products did not have HR modules that would allow us what we need to do in HR. So, um, but Brian, the other Brian, did in fact have input into that selection. Okay, but I decided that's why I just don't see value of uh, that type of person where we could hire the consultant if we need to, uh, to purchase software packages or evaluate software needs or hardware needs. But I think we definitely need another boots. On, we've always needed a couple of boots on the ground people. That would, the help desk part is astronomical. There has to be somebody. Who, who could direct workload, but also be very available for the help desk, because that's always been the issue, is having a, a single person previously trying to do all the help desk things, too. I just don't think we need to overcomplicate it. We just need a couple of working people that, that with one in charge of the department, or, or workload and, and budget, and that's it. Go ahead, Doug. So, and I just have some general comments. Um, I'm not saying one over the other necessarily, but um, from a recruiting standpoint, if we want to maintain this as a director, um, I did notice that Marshfield is paying just a little bit higher. Um, if you compare it to the private sector, which isn't necessarily apples to apples, private sector tends to be more specialized. Um, we're asking for infrastructure that knows servers, um, networks, environments. So we're really asking for probably two individuals from, from the private sector. But that pay in the private sector would be probably 125 to 140. And again, that's maybe not apples to apples. And I'm not advocating for that, but I think um, that's part of the challenge with trying to recruit for the position as it is today. What's Marshall at for their Director. Marshfield is currently at a uh, pay band of 87,900. The high end of that is 97,904. What are they doing above and beyond uh, like a lead person? Um, well, in looking at their job description, it, it appears that they are directing policy, um, setting direction for, for IT. It appears that they're doing maybe the, the director level. Not that they need it. I mean, I haven't talked with them to see um, their thoughts on it. And it's hard to sometimes know from just looking at a job description. Right. And I, the director at uh, Marshfield has three analysts and you know a couple of in interns usually. And you know, GIS with GIS in turn, so yeah, they... So there's quite a bit more supervision over a bigger staff. Yeah, there's a little bit bigger staff there. So he can do the director stuff. Right. And I just... 
think the always been the issue here for the last quite a few years has been a boots on the ground, the help desk thing. You know, that's where I just would like to see another person added, whether whether it's under Brian or to create, different, however you want to create a lead person and hire that person and have them, they're also going to help desk, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to develop policy. They're going to, Obviously, help desk is going to be their priority, but if they're not writing policy or doing something, there's nothing wrong with them going down to help them fix a computer. You know, I, I just rather see a, a working person for once and instead of adding another person on top that's going to think and direct, but not do. It seems like that's the immediate need. Yeah. I mean, there's an immediate need and then there's a visionary need that you might have. So if we have to, even if we get a director, if that's the case, you still have this need. <coughs> and so we might as well look forward to filling this and get a lead person and then reassess it as to where we are. I don't know, it just seems. I agree with Scott. Well, that, yeah, absolutely, because I, I don't think that we've really identified, aside from when Brian spoke, of what our needs really are. Not our visions, like you mentioned, Scott, is our, our actual needs. And then we're trying to find a unicorn. And, and Mr. Chairperson, you pointed out, Mr. Terry is uh, has a background in so very much. He is a unicorn. Yeah. There, you can't find someone. And we're fortunate <laughs> yeah. to have someone like that. But then combine that with um, it, with a public works director position. It, we know exactly. Well, we should know uh, because we. As, as citizens, we drive on roads, we utilize and sometimes take for granted the water and the wastewater and different things. But as far as computer is related, someone that knows back end may not know code, may not know website development, may not know all this. And, and we're asking for all this. We're looking for that unicorn. And we were fortunate in the public works aspect. But with this, I, I, I mean, Again, it, you know, and that's where that, that salary gets commended at 140000 because this person doesn't exist, you know. So the, the first thing is how would we find them in the central Wisconsin uh, rapids or central Wisconsin area um, where they're not already working somewhere. But it, maybe we got to refine that. Yeah, take care of what we need to take care of now and then re-identify what we need Forward. If, we, if there is a need, even yeah, if there is a need, but I mean, I, I found a couple mistakes on on our on our website already, and um, it, it's a case where that's the kind of stuff we need to clean up first. You know, visionary aspect that's down the road if we need it. You know, that's that's my two cents. Isn't there a referral going to finance that I see about auditing the the building and stuff like that? Oh yes. So, I haven't seen it. Wouldn't, I guess I just happened to see it when I was sent the yeah, agenda to review. I mean, I guess I'm just wondering what, what part that might play in, play in this, if that's, and I wasn't involved in that at all, so I don't know what to do with Tim or. <coughs> it so was, uh, oh. I'll just, I can just read the item if you want. Okay. Yeah. It's review and consider for approval of contract not to exceed $12,000. From OMNI Omni, Omni yeah. Resources Incorporated to conduct an IT environment assessment and assist in determining information technology priorities. Where did that come from? Um, you know, I, I don't remember getting the referral, so I'm not sure. But there's a, actually a third one too for additional services from Tyler Technologies. That's for that's you. That's me. Okay. Okay. No, we'll talk about that at finance again. Who would want to brought forth the army? We don't. Do you know, Sue? Uh, no. I Who's know the chairperson of the finance committee? I don't know. Is it you? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Brian and the mayor and I were on a phone conference with Omni, and we were looking at a contract with them where they would come in, look at our current environment, so see how our servers are currently set up. Um, see if one of our servers is getting off a full uh, data migration might be part of that and help us determine some priorities in that arena. And Brian, correct me if there's more to it than that. You no, know, I last year I, when we were looking at going to Tyler Muniz, we I wanted an assessment done um, 
to verify my observations that the current environment wasn't enough sufficient to hold the capacity for those servers. So we did end up going, um, got a free assessment from CDW that Don found, and they confirmed that yeah, we're, we need to have more servers, physical servers, for our environment to support Tyler. And so then the, the assessment that I found, we kind of put on the back burner, and um, I don't know who reinitiated it, but Don found other <coughs> resources. Um, or had worked with them for Marshall Clinic, so um, we're looking at them to come in and do another assessment um, more directed at um, Active Directory um, network infrastructure type of uh, needs. We've had quite a bit of discussion on this. It seems to me, I like to make a motion, and it may not be seconded, but that we um, post a lead tech position because it seems to me it's evident that that's a need. And then the finance and property could look at director position or how to deal with those bigger visionary items. But it's, I've heard there's a need. So why don't we post that need? So I like to make a motion to <laughs> post the uh, a lead, what do you call it? Lead te uh, tech position. Um, for the IT department. I don't know if it's second. I'll say. We have a motion and a second out of four, but we don't currently have a lead tech position, right. do we? we no, that's why I said yeah. post. I, we would need to modify the description and bring it back yeah. to the committee. Is that is that what you want? Right, but the motion to get the ball rolling and come back to the, as, to the position and to the finance and property, what that description would look like too. Okay. For the finance part, right? I think the finance. So that I, I didn't deal. know that was just more a hardware, software thing. That's not. I don't think that's personnel, yeah. right? Right. 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 I, I wasn't sure from the, the title of it, but yeah, the description will have to be prepared and uh, mm -hmm. compensation, and then that'll have to come back to right. HR. Okay. Um, that that assessment that Joe just talked. About supposed to be an all-inclusive assessment to assess the whole department to say like this is what you need for IT equipment software and was that assessment also going to address personnel there's a there is a referral form from the mayor for that that well, explains I mean, it when the, the agenda will be out this afternoon is there backup documentation that explains the synopsis of the twelve thousand dollars or whatever but the duties that they would be conducting the mayor puts that in the referral I mean, do you have an electronic copy? I'm sorry. You know what oh, I mean? well, the agenda's not out. This was just a tentative one for approval. Okay. It'll come out in probably any... should have the referral sheet on there, I would think. Yeah. I mean, because that's what... Yes, the it, it, it will be on the agenda. Right. It'll be with the agenda, I should say. Sure. I just want to reiterate, I agree, Scott. You know, I, I, I don't want to see it be a director position. I'd rather see a lead IT. Um, I don't like that word director for that over... That seems to encompass something a lot larger than what I think we are where we're at but yeah we need boots on the ground first to, to get these IT things done. I support your motion to do that. All right we have a motion and a second on the floor any further discussion? Hearing none committee will vote all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed nay ayes have it two to one. Next item, discussion uh, regarding placing an item on the HR agenda each month, which would be an update on the current city staffing and vacancies. Uh, this is a request from Alderperson Blazer. Yeah, I was just kind of looking just for uh, a HR report, because I don't want to report, but just kind of like a status of what we have for open positions and where we're at and filling them. That's all, just simply, just simply, sure. just, uh, just, hey, we've got, Five position city garage, we're in the process of filling three or something along those lines. Sure. But don't put a lot of time into it. But sure. It's well, kind of I, where can, we're at. I can go through that for this month, what oh. we have currently. So, um, something simple. We have posted the IT director, but based on the motion, I can um, revise that. We have a GIS coordinator, and we will be um, conducting interviews very, very close, I think, in two weeks. Um, we have a multimedia coordinator. And again, I believe we'll be ready to interview in two weeks. 
We have a senior city inspector. Um, that one we do not currently have applicants for. We have an entry level firefighter. This is um, to determine the eligibility list. And let's see here. We have a street supervisor that is advertised internally. This is the last day. Um, if we don't have active applicants, we will go external with that. We have a loader operator. Again, that's internally within the streets department. I would envision that would be filled internally. Um, we also posted uh, just today an IT intern. We were given notice that our <coughs> IT intern is um, has accepted a full-time position. So we're posting for that. And we are starting to hire for all of our LTEs and summer help. So that's probably about 20 to 28 individuals. Even now, I guess even simpler, if you want to just email something like that to us once a month, or if you want to give, if the chairman wants it on the agenda, maybe it's good that everybody knows where we're at, all the, anybody I, who watches. I don't have a objection to putting it on the agenda, I guess, maybe so. It's so that's a, a nice update. It's, it's a nice update, I would agree, and, and maybe so it's um, easier to follow, but hopefully not too much of a headache, if it's too much of a headache, but what I would suggest is um, just have the departments, because like say, fire department's allowed 50 guys, but there's 40 assigned, you know, so like fire department authorized 50, currently assigned 40, so you can pick it up and say, oh, we got 10 openings at the fire department. Oh, okay. So and you then, want to know numbers of yeah, openings? Yeah, and then, and then on another column, um, put projected vacancies. Like, like if somebody does announce that they're going to, so we kind of have an idea if how many departments we're looking at for people leaving. That's for anything that you do here. Sure. If that's not yeah, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I guess, yeah I'm, I'm interested in just what you did. That was perfect, Don. And I, I would prefer someone in writing with, like, that comes out with the agenda rather than like just a verbal report. Um, so that way we can have any questions ready, so to speak. But um, And I, I can't believe this hasn't been just a monthly thing, to be honest. But And it doesn't hurt to have it. To have it in writing, but then to read it here in case somebody yeah, on the TV sure. Sure. might know of somebody yeah. that might want to move in the city and Good idea. do something. So just to make it officially official, I will make a motion that each month we place on the um, HR committee agenda um, the number of vacancies and uh, pending vacancies. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Seven, discussion regarding the city's current merit pay policy section of the provisions pay policy. Uh, this is another referral from me. Um, we've all talked about all right. So, um, we ran into some problems with our merit pay once again. Uh, last month at council, we ended up having a discussion on it. And I think. The problem with our current merit pay system is, is that it there's no barometer or no way to, to measure um, workload for somebody, and it's um, how do you do that? And I really just think that we need some sort of rubric or questionnaire that we can go by, and then just assign a value to it, and. It might be a little easier coming up trying to figure this stuff out in the future as opposed to trying to measure two people from two different departments that have different job descriptions but may have in their own way had extra workload. Um, in the referral form I did attach a sample copy of uh, questions we could ask to determine what we want to do for merit pay if it's appropriate which is just basically, is the employee acting as a department head? Is the employee going beyond their normal duties? Um, has their normal workload increased? Uh, despite extra duties, uh, does the employee put forth uh, quality error-free work? Um, has the employee been helpful and demonstrated a positive attitude during this uh, period? And 
that might be a, a way to start, but I guess we can have that discussion open up to anyone that wants to weigh in on it. I guess real quick, the one, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, the one thing that I, I would like to throw out is if we have an identifiable opening or absentee or extended absentee, is maybe identify this in the front part of it, you know, with the person who we would like to um, fill in the position and ask them if they're willing to, to, to be the lead person or whatever in, in this and I identify what the job duties need to be or what the everything needs to be on the front end and then if certain things are not met you know on the back end then that's when the questions would be you know did this get done did that get done did this get done and then that would be more based on merit because there's an identified objective to begin with and then there is no um, uh, ambiguity with it. Uh, it the, the pay is already set up in the beginning uh, there's no hard feelings at the end you know and, and it's just one of those where it, in the private sector I guess it's been kind of called like a, a, a um, a contract with management type of a situation where you review it at the end and you review it with the person or maybe the committee and then it's identified that way because then that's the easiest way because then again the hard feelings is the hardest thing to deal with especially in the public sector I hate all of it to be honest the merit pay it's just it's so funny you know what I say it here and I look at Brian he's been absent with all the supervisors so are we looking at merit pay for him we have openings in, well, we had 20 some openings listed there. Are we looking at all those departments because there are people stepping in to fill those roles? I just think it's just a muddy mess. And I'm not in favor of any merit pay almost anymore unless, unless, you're act, unless somebody's acting as a supervisor that was, uh, I, I'm gonna use the clerk's office. You have, you have somebody uh, as an administrative role filling in clerk's duties I see that more appropriate versus, versus a workload in a department's heavier or you're missing an employee or two in a department. I don't know, I just think we've gone so far overboard out here. Thank, thank you. Um, that, I, that, how do you apply it? You know, I, I, like, I like the questionnaire, but how do you apply it? Because you're gonna have to apply that to every employee in the city with every department almost. Because if they're filling in job roles that aren't necessarily roles, but it's a vacant within that department. So are they warrant low merit pay then? I don't like any of it. I have to kind of echo that after what happened at council last month. I just, I had a headache over the whole situation. Because we ended up amending one of them anyway, and then, you know what I mean? I think it passed, what, 5-3? So, I mean, we couldn't, you know, Something like that you'd think would be unanimous as much as we hashed it out over the past two months, but yeah. but it wasn't. So, I mean, it's just messy. I kind of agree because I think you'd get more hurt feelings than I do too, positive. The only thing I, the, the, I think if you were to give merit pay, it would kick in after a person is absent uh, for two months or three months, then go back. I mean, for the week, otherwise somebody's going <laughs> to look at this daily or weekly or, you know, it, 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 it's, it's going to be a mess. So uh, I'm against the merit pay unless it's a unique circumstances where like six months that we had an opening or like three months or two months. Then I think it may kick in, but um, unless we have a timeline like that, I think just to have, I, I like your questions, and I think the t the uh, value is it is merited. But um, I don't know. It just seems to me, unless we have a, a large chunk of time, it's it's not viable. So. I think HR, I think Donald's be spending her days trying to go through sheets here on who's getting what pay for what to, but I kind of, you know, I, I believe it may be a step up pay and I think the fire department uses it for different positions if, because different positions have a different pay and if that person's gone and somebody steps into that, they would get that rate of pay during that step up time. And I could see an employee stepping up into a semi-quasi leadership or a, a supervisory role 
is, and then a step up pay would warrant. But I think an employee within a department that's doing work that's a non supervisory work, well, that's just part of your job. You know, you just, that's what you do versus versus stepping up into a supervisory role. So that, I, I, I would be in favor of a, a step up pay into a supervisory role versus doing extra jobs. Because if you're doing extra duties, whether it's, and more so whether, it, you know, if, if, the, if there's a vacancy within the department, that's what you do. But if you're doing something above and beyond what your job description is, well then that's a, the department has responsibility to notify HR that they need to reevaluate the job at that point. But I think what we're dealing with here is a vacancy, and if it's a vacancy for a supervisor, then, then you have a step up pay, whatever that may be, per week, per couple weeks, or I would say a vacancy, so it'd be, it would be a vacancy, not a vacation, or or something along those lines. But it, when it's just a general fellow employee that's gone, well, most departments always seem to have some to vacancy at some time, and, and you just close ranks and you get the job done. It's just part of the day. And most descriptions have the last line that something might be all of it. It's a generic. All above or something. <laughs> but something that might be added. And so you, you took that position. You know that things might change. Like uh, I think of a vacancy for a number of months and so forth. Yeah. It merited, but um, something's changed. You, you add something, and that's the way it is. You know. Maybe you have to take something off that person's plate. Who knows? But yeah. I really don't know <clears throat> which way to go with this. I just know that the the merit pay waters are really muddy at this point in time, and we are government. We're not private sector, so I'll bring the ham back. We're not giving employees a Christmas ham necessarily, and. You know, somebody somebody explained this to me once, and it really makes sense, right? We we talk about trying to attract and retain quality employees, all right? But you look at what's going on in our economy right now. The, the economy is good, so you can go to the mill and you can you can make good money. You get overtime, you get call in pay, you get all this other stuff, and you're you're up here right now. You know, you can you can some places write your own check. And you could you got extra money, you can buy the boat, you can buy the camper, you can go on vacation. But your government employee, they're stuck down here. So while your mill person might be up here between sixty and eighty thousand dollars a year and they're doing really well, your government employee is stuck right here. You know, average employee probably forty to sixty thousand dollars. All right? And that's just the way it's gonna be when the economy is like this. But the economy doesn't stay like that. Eventually something happens, the markets crash and and then all of a sudden the mill starts laying off people and there's not money going into other businesses and so the person that was up here making all this money they're now on an employment they don't have anything so they had to sell the boat the camper they're not going on vacation up north anymore they're just scraping nickels to get by but the person that was in government they still have their job because you always need your admin people at city hall you always need your fire department you always need your police department so the people that are working in government still have their job but it so the benefit for having a government job is consistency. you're consistent. You, you don't get to be up here when the economy is good, but you're shielded when the economy is down here and it's not the greatest. And it, I know there's a, there should be an appreciation for that, right? Because you're consistent. But when the times are up here and they're good, and you have people that work in government and say, well, you know, gee, I work just as hard as everyone else does. I really like to be recognized for a job well done, but then you kind of run into it of, well, there's, I don't, I'm not, I don't get anything if I work any harder, so where's my incentive? I'll just, if I'm a equipment operator at the street department and my department is down five guys, I don't care because I only get paid to be an equipment operator. That's all I'm gonna be, that's all I'm gonna do. Sure, it might say to assist in other duties as directed or all other assignments as needed, but any employee can find a way out of that. You know, hey Steve, go mix tar. Well, I don't know how to operate the tar mixer. Oh, okay, well you can't do that then. Well, go over here, run that piece of equipment. Oh, I, I just know how to run the end loader, sir. So then, the department still 
behind because nobody nobody's going to want to take the initiative to go learn how to run the other machine or do anything else if there's like no recognition for doing it and how do we recognize our employees i mean we're we're government we just we can't open up the checkbook and say well we'll write you a big check for doing this if you learn it we, we can't we can't give out exceptions and numbers of time off, but I think the question here is then what do we what do we want to do to encourage our employees to help out when times are hard and their departments are short? How do we want to recognize employees for stepping up? How would how would we want to encourage somebody to step in an department head's role versus have somebody say like, well we don't have a superintendent down at the street department, I take that responsibility. So we don't do anything for them nobody's going to want to do anything and it, I mean yeah we could certainly fire back and say well you know what you got a government job you're consistent but then what's going to happen when the economy is good they're going to say well I don't feel appreciated although where I do feel appreciated I disagree I think if there's an opening in a department and something needs to get done especially at the street department those guys pull up their bootstraps and they just go get it done. Same with the fire department and every department. I do agree though, if, if there's a step by to a supervisor, yeah, then, then that person needs to be recognized. But if you're out there and there's a greater operator and there's somebody that knows how to used to be the greater operator, I believe that that person would hop in the greater and end up, if they were directed to drive the greater, they would drive the greater. Um, I don't think they would say, no, I'm not a greater operator anymore. I'm not gonna drive greater. I think most of those guys out there will, dive in and do what they need to do to get the job done, um, be shorthanded or not shorthanded. But I do agree that supervisors, that's why we, we look for relief supervisors on the street department. So there is people that fill in those roles when when they get filled if they're not filled yet, and uh, those get done. But um, and that's where I think a step up pay would warrant, be warranted versus just drive out job openings. I don't know, I'm with the chairperson. I don't know if I'd want to operate a tire mixer. We don't have one anyways. See what I'm <laughs> <laughs> I think that there was actually a, 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 not to be light on this, but there was actually a Parks and Rec episode that dealt with this. And Leslie No tried to get like a, a step up pay or a merit pay or something for her department after she I don't know, Ron Swanson was gone for a while or something, and it, she's like, I can get this, I can get this, and the long story short was is that it, it's not her, it's not the employees, it's the taxpayers that we represent. And they, at the end of the day, it's one of those where, yeah, it, 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 I think every local government deals with this, the, the kind of how do we actually do it, and at the end of the day, it's it, the number one thing is you gotta look at can you, give taxpayer money for a bonus type of a thing uh, unless you got an absolutely you know uh, um, a hard um, uh, policy to, to do it with but at the end of the day I mean private sector the owner is giving the hams but the owner of the local government is you know the taxpayers as a whole so that's what and why local governments tend to do the easy thing and not give out anything because it's it, it makes it clear cut across the board for everybody. Fair. It's, it's fair. It's the fairest to the fair. But, you know, it, it's not a great incentive, but it's easy to blame it on that you know, everybody across the board doesn't get anything. So, um, yeah, it, like I said, Leslie, no, kind of figure that one out. So I'll figure out what episode that is. Bring it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just uh, kind of going off of that parking record, so, but <laughs> something that Earl said earlier that, I mean, to maybe just recognize it in those situations where you need to appoint, you know, there's actually a formal motion to appoint someone interim something because the department head is going to be gone for a period of time or whatever. And so with those circumstances, you know, will be known on the front end. You might not know for how long, you know, ideally it might just be a couple months, but sometimes it goes straight on to six or seven months. Yeah. And in those situations, you know, I think you almost have to have that conversation with the employee of what are your expectations, what are you going to be doing, how are you going to do your other job, or, you know, your mm -hmm. present job. And then they would know up front and whether at that point you determine what the compensation is, 
what the step up pay is, yeah. or um, it's determined but they don't get it unless, you know, we can get into the weeds there about how they performed or not at the end, but um, I, I think it really has to be for for an interim appointment that's actually either made, I don't know if the mayor makes it, or the HR, HR committee and council, that it, and it has to almost be a department head or a, you know, kind of a division head. Uh, because police, fire, streets for the most part they they have that built into their their salaries a lot with the step up pay and you know temporary appointment and that type of thing that's in the contracts or it's in uh, public works policies but you know uh, I mean I guess that, those are the situations that I that I think of and, and like the Subrovic situation you know we really did you, you appointed her deputy clerk and then the whole idea is we need someone during this time yeah. um market situation was a little different and i guess whether that would apply to this situation i guess i'm saying probably would it be that situation uh, with what i'm talking about but not not belittling what she did or whatever because i was right there with her and saw the things that she needed to do and and the, for the period of time that she did it but um i guess that's just my personal thoughts on on this because I see I mean I feel badly that if you're going to get rid of it or you're going to narrow it down that there's a lot of people putting in a lot of work you know I think about Munis I think about Brian Landowski I you know just a lot of people that are working extra and um, but you know you kind of just gotta draw the line somewhere and say this is the policy and and, and go forward and, and I'm saying that Brian might not get you know something at some point because maybe that is what he's kind of doing right now or if he worked out at some point but just my thoughts yeah and I I agree with that you know it and I said this before in the closed session I'll say it in open session is that you know during slow times we don't ask for a refund so th there are times where we're busy than others and a slow time do you we have slow times. We all have it in our jobs, and, and you relax and enjoy it because you know there are going to be busier times, and that's just the nature, especially of a salaried employee, which is different because you have that built into the salary. Otherwise, you just leave them at hourly, and then they can collect overtime if you're a non-management salary person. So I agree with Sue. Make a clear cut, appointing that position ahead of time, asking them to fill that role. And it's all out there to open it. So I would have to echo what's been said here so far. I have heard that there are hard feelings. There is resentment. Um, it's sad. I, I feel bad, you know, for those individuals. I think um, some of those individuals that have received those payments were, were meant to feel bad, and, and I don't think that's fair either. Um, I would... Absolutely, I think we need a policy that is a little bit more black and white, that we can apply consistently and fairly throughout the city. If that means maybe we have a, a certain pay per month, step up pay we'll call it, and um, it's only for vacancies of department heads, and we identify the scope and the primary responsibilities ahead of time, that makes sense to me. Um, Do any of the departments here use job coding like for example the street department if you're an equipment operator that's a job code 10 yeah. but if you're yeah. putting down tar yes. that's a job code 20. Yeah. yes streets department uses that so depending on the job that you're working for that day you're paid at that rate higher or lower but you're you're paid at that appropriate rate for the position that you're doing for that day or for that week yeah, you know, this is one of the, whether you like Act 10 or don't like Act 10 type of thing, this is one of the unintended consequences because a lot of places the union contracts spelled out everything. You know, we don't have that for most of everything. Well, this is kind of what I'm thinking is kind of referencing my street department analogy earlier, but if I think if you're do if you're if you're posted to a job and you're asked to do another job, I think that issue kind of solves itself by having the pay code if, if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe the way to go is looking at a uniform step-up pay policy and making it a per-hour uh, step-up pay. So if, if somebody's going to be stepping up into a supervisor position, that that's a step-up 
if it's a superintendent position, there's an amount for that. And if it's a department head, step up, there's an amount for that. You should do it per week or per pay period or per month because you're talking about a salary position. Okay. So it, you can do it, but it should be a flat rate because it's a salary position. Okay. Well, then probably per pay period, that would be a better way to do it. I was just going to say, I, I, I personally really like Sue's, Sue's suggestion of this HR committee comes in and says, you know, Brian, you're, I'm not going to use any people, so you're going to take a person and you're going to appoint them to fill that position temporarily. So it's very clear, and an HR committee can decide that, and at that time, you can decide what the step up pay, and then if the employee agrees and, and the committee agrees, it's really simple, but I think now you're, now I think we're really down to such a minute pay period, month, where I think it would be just fair, easy, consistent HR says, you know, we need somebody to fill this role. We'd like you to fill this role temporarily, and this will be the pay for that role. If you're interested, yay or nay. And go from there and just keep it simple. And unfortunately for employees doing their work, you know, it's that's just your job. You do what you can in your day, and whatever you get done in that day, you get done. But it's not a supervisory role. I like I like the fact of appointing that person in that position ahead of time. And it's clearly spelled out that so we're not on the back end trying to figure out who gets what and what's that pay worth and it's just agreed upon between hr committee ultimately council and that employee i think it's just simple um no i didn't have much right. scott no that makes sense to me you know i didn't know what you said about you know um people doing different jobs and so forth in the, in the departments but like in the school system it's the same way all my teachers get the same pay. I think it's the relationships you have in the department, the people in the department working together. Um, you know, the morale is relationships, not necessarily that I'm going to get an extra 10 bucks per se. So um, I kind of agree with that. Uh, Joe? I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I, none of this can apply to police or fire anyway, right? So, I mean, I don't know. Well, I'll make a motion um, that we abandon the current merit pay system and that an employee is appointed to fill in interim's position and it's talked about uh, at the HR committee prior um, prior to that person taking on those duties like kind of like what Shane just said go ahead do we want a, a limit though I mean like here we have four hundred dollars per month in this one as a maximum as a max I mean and that's fifty dollars a you know a week right I, I, you know, I think there's, you know, one person gets 75, one person gets 50. I think at 50, that's $10 a day per hour. And when you think about it, if you hit, I think if you have a number in there, rather than each person coming in and saying uh, they they deserve this much more, but if we have in the policy a number, Just a fixed amount. it might be more advantageous. That's all I'm thinking. I agree with that. I would Amend my motion to reflect fifty dollars a week. Yeah. A second. All right, we have a motion and second on the floor. Is there any further discussion? What about mandatory high fives? <laughs> <laughs> By the mayor, he's got to give up fifty high fives. All right. <laughs> Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Ayes have it. Discussion regarding. Group short and long term disability policy for city employees. So, um, this is actually a referral, and I guess I just have um, a few background or, or some information to point out. Um, as probably the council is aware, we changed our sick and paid leave policy recently to allow for up to eight weeks of paid leave. Um, so, the city's paying those first eight weeks. If you're gone longer, you can use vacation, um, sick, personal leave, whatever you have. 
Um, however, that policy currently applies to the non-union employees. So fire and police currently have our former policy, which was the 12 weeks of paid leave. You can't return. Um, you have an additional 12 weeks. So um, you know, we just want to point out that that was what was decided. So currently, during 2019, we've had two employees. One has exceeded eight weeks, and one has come close to exceeding eight weeks. So um, out of the whole city, currently right now, we have two individuals, <coughs> one who may benefit from a short-term policy after that um, eight weeks is expired, um, one who is close, and we just don't have information about if he or she is going to be able to return within those eight weeks or not. Um, you know, you can look at a voluntary short-term and long-term disability policy. We can certainly quote that out for the city. Most of those, um, so that what that means is the employee pays the premium. Most of those would require that employees first use paid vacation, uh, personal time, sick time, frozen sick, anything that that employee has coming to her or him, generally those policies require that they be used up front. So, um, and I'm just providing this for background purposes. For a newer employee, so let's say someone has been here six months, that may be advantageous and they may wish to take advantage of it. For an employee that is more tenured and has been here 25 years, they may have, um, you know, personal time, vacation time, sick time, frozen sick bank time. They may not wish to purchase that. So I think you're you're looking at varying needs depending on the amount of time you've been actually employed. So I just wanted to do some background. Yeah, I agree. And back in another lifetime when I worked in another county, we had the AFAC lady, and she'd come in and she would meet with us, and it was all payroll deducted. So. You know, we could choose a la carte what we wanted off that, and then the the, the premiums were payroll deducted and sent it that way. And it worked out well. So you, you got to determine what you wanted. I think it's also, uh, it, it's novel to try and suggest that we could do this, but long-term and short-term disability is based on the individual and based on their job classification as well. And I've got, I got long-term disability insurance on myself. What when I was an iron worker before, I continuously paid dues. Or whatever, but early on, I could never get long-term disability. They said no one ever would insure it, no matter what amount of money, because if I got hurt off the job, anything could take me away from work, or I could find a loophole for you know being an iron worker. Whereas then, when I transitioned to be um, in an administrative role and an office role, I got very inexpensive disability insurance. The cool thing is, is that if you keep on paying it, as long as your um, premium is still lapse, you can go back to being an iron worker and still have long-term disability. But that's the thing is that everybody's judging on themselves because this isn't like health insurance, it's a little bit different animal. And again, with the, the, the fewer participants, whether it's AFLAC or whether it's a surety or whoever else is in the game, they don't underwrite everybody um, and if it was a case where we wanted to try and create a, a universal policy for everybody and pool it together, it may be so cost prohibitive by bringing people in that it just, it, it, it wouldn't be effective for everybody. So I, 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 with my little bit of, of experience with that, um, yeah, it, it, employees can get it on their own, but I don't know if the organization can create a mechanism for offering it to everybody just by sheer cost. Or you can bring a third party in to do it. Who's was that with me? You can bring Unum, yeah. Colonial, I mean any of them would do voluntary Apply. and then it would like uh, it would let them allow, yes I want to opt in, no yep. I no I don't want to opt in yep. type situation. I got a good thing. I guess just uh like across the river what we have is um county wide it's just a certain percentage of your wage. So it doesn't really matter what department you're in or whatever, and, and you have to do the, you know, there's exclusionary things and pre-existing conditions and, every, and everything, but um, but the rate actually is the same for everybody. It's, I don't know, it's 
Now, obviously, your experience is different, but it might be self-insured. You might be in a self-insured okay. that has a maximum uh, that's payout. That could be the difference then. But you don't have sick time, correct? So you have a short-term disability in place of sick time. Is no, that, no. That you have there's a two-week elimination period where you have to use sick personal time or whatever. Okay. Yeah, and then, but it's voluntary. I mean, I'm, a lot of people don't have it. So, so you elect to, to have it? Is that what you're saying? The individual employee elects whether or not they want it, long or short term. So did you pay the premium the payroll duck? Yeah. Pay duck period. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. you know, I guess if it is a cost to the city and taxpayers, and it's an option that employees could have that could be set up and employees could decide to payroll deduct into it after we're not out, I think it's yeah, that could be it's not a bad benefit. It would solve some of those issues. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but yeah, if the organization could use its leverage power to be able to offer it to employees based on a larger group buy-in, that yeah, absolutely. So uh, we could, and we could quote it out as a group. However, voluntary policies are generally higher because, right, you you're not opting in everyone. Yeah, exactly. So we can certainly look at rates if that's what the group feels we want to do. As yeah, long as it's not a cost to taxpayers, I think that'd be a good, good option. Scott, yeah, I agree. All right, um, I'll make a motion for us to look at uh, short-term and long-term disability policies, and hopefully have something that we can uh, look at next month. I'll second. We should look for July first. That's our renewal. Um, I'd like to amend the motion to reflect a July 1 effective date then. Yes. All right, we have motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Uh, next item on the agenda, can, uh, discuss and consider approval of the proposed ordinance changing the 30 mile residency requirement for the city personnel to read this right. Changing the 15. Changing the 15 to changing the 15 to 30 miles uh, referral from older person blazer from the last council meeting. Well, I guess we've talked about this many, many times, and I guess I didn't think it was going to come back to HR, being that it's already been discussed many times at HR and council. And I'm just looking for an uh, ordinance. Mixing out 15 and making 30 in there with no other changes, just being done with this once and for all. But I, I, I think the biggest concern is Scott. Please correct me if I was wrong. If I'm wrong, but I think you already have you already have policies in place that are going to address um, call-ins and those type of things. That there shouldn't be really any issues with. I can, I may have muddied the water a little bit, saying if you live outside of the 15 miles that you're not eligible. I think. If they're in town or it's a shift change, I, I, it came to me that the union may have an issue with allowing them to take a call in or a transfer, being they live without. So I would agree with this ordinance change, and we have policies in place that have minutes. They're expected to be into the station in 15 minutes right. for an emergency call in or an off duty transfer. I think we can police ourselves. Yeah, I think so too. I, I don't think I need to say any more on this. I'd, I'd look to make the motion to uh, have this ordinance changed as stated on the agenda. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. In open session, the committee will vote to go into closed session under section 19.85 paragraph 1 E of the Wisconsin State Statutes which reads deliberating, negotiating, or purchasing public properties, the investing in public funds, or conducting other specified public business whatever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. In closed session, the committee will discuss ongoing negotiation strategies and parameters regarding successor labor agreements with the International Association of Firefighters, Local 425, and the Wisconsin Rapids Professional Police Association. The committee will return to open session and may take action on successor labor agreements with the IAFF Local 425 and WRPPA. 
with that, I will make a motion to go into closed session. I'll second. Roll call vote. Joe? Aye. Scott? Aye. Myself? Aye. We are in closed session. Somebody want to get the, tell the, so we're not. I would.